Belgrade, the capital of Serbia. In 2002, Dr. Dragan Dabic, a specialist in alternative medicine, settled here. Nobody knew where he was from or what his occupation had been before. Dr. Dabic won instant popularity in the medical community. He gave lectures and cured people of diseases. We see him as someone who helps people, and people love him. In 1996, Radovan Karadzic, leader of the Bosnian Serbs, was put on an international wanted list for charges of terror and exterminating people in his home country. A $5 million reward was offered for information on his whereabouts. For 44 months, Karadzic directed a campaign of terror against a civilian population. Radovan Karadzic was arrested only in 2008 when he was brought before the International Tribunal at The Hague. During the 13-year-long manhunt for him, nobody, not even friends and close relatives, knew that Karadzic and Dr. Dabic were the same person. The small town of Pale, 20 kilometers from Bosnia's capital, Sarajevo. The psychiatrist Radovan Karadzic settled down here in the mid-1960s. He had received a thorough education in his home country, and later in the 1970s, he attended Columbia University in New York. He first met his wife Liliana when he was still an undergraduate. When I gave birth to my daughter, I was about 21 years old. Radovan was just under 22 at the time. We raised our daughter together and we grew older together. Some time passed before I gave birth to my son. And then our daughter got married. The wedding was very cheerful. Radovan was a man and our kids could rely on. But he wasn't very strict. We used democratic methods to raise our children. We lived together in Pali until the war. In 1992, a bloody civil war broke out in Bosnia, a former part of the Republic of Yugoslavia. About half of its population call themselves Bosnian Muslims. The rest call themselves Orthodox Serbs. Radovan Karadzic became leader of the Orthodox Serbs and president of the Serbian Republic in Bosnian territory. When Radovan entered politics in 1990, he did so against his own will. He had been urged to enter politics from all sides. I was not particularly pleased. I said to him, these are going to be hard times for the two of us and the whole family. And yet, I supported his decision. If that's what you want, let it be, I said. The war in Bosnia lasted nearly three years and ended in 1995 when a 50,000-strong international peacekeeping force was brought in. The country was split in two. Orthodox Serbs were now in control of nearly half the territory. In 1996, Radovan Karadzic had to leave his presidential post under pressure from the International Tribunal at The Hague. Radovan became a leader by accident. He is a psychiatrist by profession and a poet in spirit and a national leader inside. He did what he had to, and he did it fairly skillfully and honestly. He did what he could to make sure that the people acquired a state of their own. After his resignation, Radovan Karadzic disappeared from the political scene. A massive manhunt was launched against him. Every peacekeeper stationed in Bosnia had a picture of him. Post-war chaos and widespread Serb support made it possible for Karadzic to live in the town of Pale for some time, right under the noses of his pursuers. I last saw my brother in the early winter of 1998. We would see each other late at night, hoping that we would be safer that way. He would briefly stay with us, his daughter in her flat, and then go on to stay with some other relatives. That night, we also discussed questions of security. Most local people shared the view that Radovan would either be killed or arrested. In early 2002, a flat was rented in a large residential area on the outskirts of Belgrade. Official papers said that Dr. Dragan Dabic, 
A retired Serb from America who specialized in alternative medicine was living in that flat. He was rumored to be able to cure people with his hands by invoking his own energy. He would stay at home all day long without venturing outside. After the assassination of Serbian Prime Minister Zoran Djindjic in 2003, police scoured the city in search of the assassins. For that reason, Radovan thought staying at home all the time was a bad idea. He decided to show himself in public and lead a normal life to avoid suspicion. The other reason was quite commonplace. He needed to make a living somehow. Once a man entered this office in my clinic and introduced himself as Dr. Dabic. He was wearing elegant clothes and looked very cultured. He bowed to show his respect to me. He said he wanted to help people because he possessed a very powerful energy. I told him he could use it here if it was really effective. Dr. Sava Bojevic is a professor. Some time ago, he opened a fertility clinic in the suburbs of Belgrade to study human reproduction. Bojevic suggested they set up an experiment to test Dr. Dabic's skills. We did a microscopic examination of the sperm of one of my patients. We used this microscope. The sperm was of poor quality. It wasn't active enough. I asked Dr. Dabic to test his powers on it. As I held the sample in my hands, he repeatedly passed one of his hands over it and the other underneath it. It took him 15 minutes to complete the job. After that, I examined the sample under a microscope once again. I saw that the sperm had become much more mobile. Damage had demonstrated his very powerful energy. Sava Bojevic had a very high opinion of Dr. Dabic's skills. He wished to have a long and fruitful period of cooperation with him. This celebration marks the clinic's 20th anniversary. Dragan Dabic was among the dignitaries invited to attend it. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Dr. Dabic turned up at public functions. He made new contacts and struck up new friendships. Mia Sitsak was one of Dabic's new friends. They met at the medical conference dedicated to alternative treatments. Soon he asked her to be his assistant. Dr. Dabic invited me to go to a sick boy to examine him. We went to the house where he lived. There we met the child. His name was Danilo and his parents. Danilo was born in 2004 into the family of political fugitive Branko Balaban. When the war broke out, Branko, his young wife and her parents moved from Bosnia to Belgrade. Danilo became seriously ill when he was one year old. He paid no attention to the people around him. His mental development slowed down. He made no attempt to engage with anybody, not even with his parents or elder sisters. At that first meeting, Danilo constantly connected with the doctor. Soon they were already communicating with each other. The boy tugged at the doctor's beard and took his hat from him. We were surprised. It was like a miracle. Dr. Damage wasted no time treating the boy's illness. My son liked the doctor very much. He played with his beard and moustache. <laughs> we always met outside Danilo's house in the morning at about 7 o'clock. Dr. Dabic normally came by bicycle wearing his hat. It was a very funny spectacle. The doctor would put his hands around the boy's head like this. He kept his hands close to the back of the head like this. Sometimes he pressed his hands against the head. Otherwise, he kept them a short distance away. If he wanted to produce an effect on the brain, he would put his hands on this spot and keep them there for a long time. Dr. Dabic did what traditional medicine had failed to do. Finally, Danilo began taking note of the people around him and tried to talk with them. He could now show his emotions and indicate what he wanted through gestures. 
As soon as the boy woke up, the doctor would begin playing with him, just as anyone would play with their children. Danilo thought about taking off the doctor's glasses and lifting his mustache in an attempt to kiss him on the mouth. It was great fun. The press dubbed him the Bosnian butcher. The international tribunal at The Hague charged him on 11 counts, including genocide, forcible deportation, and extermination of people, terrorism, and hostage taking. The special services of most European countries were trying to hunt him down. The Hague Tribunal was demanding that Serbia extradite Radovan Karadzic. An international obligation from Belgrade is to arrest him and to deliver him. Meanwhile, he was in Belgrade meeting his colleagues at seminars and pursuing a successful medical career under an assumed name, Dragan Dabic. Is that so much as I was about to say that those I like the form of Soviet law. Yeah, but real plan behind the thought. Start forward or start back. Will the new strategic arms reduction treaty between Russia and the US ever become law? Obama is putting wealthy British scion Zach Wilson. Markets, finance, scandal. Find out what's really happening to the global economy in Kaiser Report on RT. By 2007, Dragan Dabic had published several articles in medical journals. He earned a reputation in the medical community. He joined the Red Cross, gave lectures and held seminars. At one of the sessions, he met Mina Minic, a Serb painter, who was practicing alternative medicine. My grandpa used to sit here, and this was his desk. This is where he received patients. Whenever Dr. Davic came round, he was here too. He used this computer. He and grandpa were co-writing a book about alternative medicine. When David stayed here well into the night, he slept in this room on the couch. Mina Minic, a healer with extrasensory powers, badly needed advice from a professional physician. The two men spent a lot of time working together. They gave treatment to sick people, and they hoped they would be able to complete that book together. Mina Minic even offered Dr. Dabic to move into his house. The house was under construction. The top floor was still missing. I was going to accommodate him on that floor with those two windows as soon as it was ready. Those plans never came to fruition. After mid-July 2008, Mina Minic and Dragan Dabic never saw each other again. Once Mina invited me to attend one of his sessions, it was past one o'clock in the morning when the session was over. Mina asked me to take Dr. Davich to his house in my car. I was going the same way. Velomir and Dr. Davich became fast friends. Velomir often took Davich home in his car. They would talk throughout the drive. He shared his problems with a professional psychologist. Dragan was always ready to help, the people he knew. He always did his best to help, but I don't think he ever asked for help. At least I never heard such requests from him. I always paused at this traffic light. He would get out of the car and walk away. I never even saw the house where he lived. Dr. Dabich's unusual style made him stand out in a crowd. But people who saw that man never suspected that he had a five million dollar bounty on his head. Davich lived in this flat. I lived on the ground floor. I recall that when my father died, he met me at the entrance to the house and gave me his visiting card with D.D. Davich written on it. He said he was a psychotherapist and offered help. I invited him to come to my flat for a cup of coffee. I felt relieved after talking to him. Radovan Karadzic never dyed his hair, nor did he ever have plastic surgery. His only disguise was that of old age, grey hair and a long beard. 
I always thought that the man who often came here was Dr. Dabich, not Radovan Karadzic. His appearance and behavior betrayed his great intellect. As a rule, he would buy one apple and one pear and one pepper. I thought it was very odd, but that's exactly what attracted my attention. Besides his appearance, he was very extravagant. His house was nearby. I also know that he often sat here, just outside the Luda Kucha Cafe. Initially, he bought stuff in the shop across the road. His unusual appearance marked him out in the crowd. Later, he began visiting my cafe, too. Whenever Dabich heard guests playing the psaltery, he dropped in to listen. He is a very affable man. He would always ask for permission to take a seat. If he found himself in good company, he would always thank each guest. He played the psaltery on several occasions and was quite good at it, but he never sang. He preferred to drink red wine, called bear's blood, but never to excess. He simply enjoyed the wine's taste. While Radovan Karadzic was in hiding in Belgrade under the guise of Dr. Dabic, the homes of his wife and children in the Bosnian town of Pale were constantly raided and searched. One massive roundup happened during the night. There was a large number of military and police vehicles, and even tanks and a helicopter. When we looked out of the window, we were blinded by a bright red light. It was so intense that it hurt our eyes. We were very scared. Psychological pressure on his family was one of the methods the authorities used to compel Radovan Karadzic to surrender. In 2005, Liliana Karadzic asked her husband to do just that in a televised address. With all my heart and soul, I beg you to give yourself up. Although it pains me greatly to have to ask you for that. It will be a sacrifice for our own sake and for the sake of our family. Journalists put forward fantastical theories to explain why she had done it. One of them put her behavior down to feign jealousy of an invented mistress. Tabloids assigned that role to Dabic's assistant Mila Tsitsak. But the fact is that she first met Dr. Dabic only two years after Liliana's televised address. I never had a love affair with him. We had a friendly relationship and we worked together in this humanitarian job, if I can call it that. Police in this country and in foreign countries knew we were not in touch. Even so, we were often searched. They would break into our home and take us in for questioning. My son spent 10 days in custody. I was under pressure from various foreign services. They threatened to arrest me and my daughter. I asked Radovan to give himself up because I saw no other solution, persuading them to leave at least my children alone. I thought that price would set my son free. The search for Karadzic was conducted both in built-up cities and difficult mountainous regions. The Yellow Press regularly churned out conflicting reports concerning his whereabouts. But in fact, he had never left the Serbian capital. His friends regularly received letters from him. Moreover, he himself put them into their post boxes. It was past midnight when I received a call from a man. I didn't recognize his voice. He asked me to examine my letterbox in the entrance hall. I went downstairs, opened the box and found a CD there. When I opened it on my computer, I saw a novel written by Karadzic. After the war, Miroslav Tohol, the ex-information minister of the Serbian Republic, founded a publishing house in Belgrade. He published the novel by his former workmate and friend. Moreover, the publication fetched a small profit. 
Well, every book published by us is in this shop, except for books written by Karadzic. This means they are sold out. This is very good. Each day, Dr. Dabic took the number 73 bus to the fertility clinic for work. He found the route very convenient. It took him from 30 to 50 minutes to get there. Like many times before, on July 18th, 2008, Dr. Dabic boarded a number 73 bus outside his home. And it seemed just like any other trip to work. 2 sturdily built young men had approached him in the bus and were standing side by side with him. Sometime later, another two men got on the bus. They said to him, you must get off and follow us. They took him out of the bus, bundled him into a car, pulled a woolen cap over his eyes and drove him to some place he knew nothing about. Three days passed before he was put in a court jail and told that he had been arrested. The arrest of Radovan Karadzic in 2008 stirred the Balkans. The Muslims rejoiced. But massive protest actions involving thousands of people were held in the streets of Serbian towns. Today, some Serbian youth organizations still take advantage of any pretext to demonstrate their support for Karadzic. Even sporting events are politically charged. Quite often, fans will chant the name of Radovan Karadzic rather than cheer on their favorite team. It's a double standard. They use one standard when judging Muslims and Croats and a different standard for Serbs. They laugh at us right in our face. We must stick up for our heroes. The fans of all Serbian teams must stand up for him all together. In 2008, Radovan Karadzic was brought before the Hague Tribunal, which was founded for the express purpose of investigating war crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia. Since Radovan's disappearance, I have heard thousands of stories claiming he is either dead or arrested, or seriously ill, or has suffered a stroke, or has been deported from one place to another. This is the most terrible ordeal that I have ever gone through. I can say now that I know he's been arrested. I feel better. It's because I know he's alive and I can see him and talk to him. Liliana Karadzic spends most of her time in The Hague. She sees her husband quite often, but those meetings are excruciating for them both. They do talk a lot, but what they have to talk about is not what they want. We can't talk about something significant. We can't talk about intimate matters either, because we know that all the time they are listening to us. We also know somebody might use what we say against him. Therefore, I see to it that he doesn't get into trouble, and I am allowed to continue getting calls from him. One of the most heinous charges brought against Radovan Karadzic by the Hague Tribunal is a Srebrenica massacre. According to some sources, in July 1995, 8,000 Bosnian Muslims were massacred in that city after Serbian troops seized it with apparent ease. The Srebrenica episode was a fabrication. Actually, the death toll there was much less. Most of those people died in fighting. A war was going on. And the Muslims claimed that dead soldiers were in fact massacred civilians. The presumption of innocence exists in Anglo-Saxon and European legislation. But the Hague Tribunal, this principle presumably means the following. Everyone is innocent until they're proven to be Serbs. According to some of the materials that the Hague Tribunal is expected to consider, the police and the army of the Serbian Republic organized a wholesale massacre of Muslim residents. The corpses were buried in mass graves. We all know what's going on in The Hague. He's been called a criminal and a butcher, but I don't believe those charges. He's made several calls to us from The Hague to ask me about Danila and his behavior. He told me how Danila should be treated in the future. He also asked me whether Danila was receiving the treatment recommended by him. Once he called to wish him happy birthday.
Branko Balaban doesn't believe that somebody who has given treatment to his child might give orders to kill people. As far as his family is concerned, the man sitting in the dock at The Hague will be forever the good Dr. Dabich, whom geopolitical games have deprived of the opportunity to cure their boy. I'm deeply convinced this court is representing itself falsely as a court of the international community when it is in fact a court of NATO whose aim is to liquidate me. It is therefore very hard for me to express my standpoint on anything before this is cleared up. I have stopped using a false name and I think all parties should do the same. Now Serbia is in a state of quiet, secret occupation. NATO people are everywhere, starting from the Defense Ministry and the Interior Ministry. We have no more territory of our own. We are guests in this territory. Foreigners are our masters. A new generation has grown up in Serbia since Radovan Karadzic was in hiding under the guise of Dr. Dabic. To them, Yugoslavia is just a page in a history book. Bosnia is a different country, and Bosnians are foreigners. And yet fresh graffiti can still be seen on the wall of the house where Dr. Dabic lived. It says Radovan Karadzic Street. <laughs> 